There's a culture of learning that develops in, in a collaborative environment where there's exchange and choice and genuine human interaction. And uh, to participate in that evolving culture of the classroom is, is a privilege. I really woke up to ideas, I would say as a 10th grader. When I went to a private school in Greenwich, Connecticut and met a student of Ludwig von Mises who was teaching a high school economics class. She was great friends with uh, Leonard Reed and Bettina and Percy Graves of the Foundation for Economic Education. And so my roots really came out of that environment. And it's where I discovered that I love to think, that I love ideas, and that I love freedom. But it was really my encounter with the Austrian tradition of economics, um, especially Mises and Hayek, that I think turned me to pedagogy, reading the use of knowledge in society. You can really read that not as a piece of economics or even just you know, political philosophy, but as a work of, of pedagogy. He's talking about how knowledge is distributed amongst unique individuals and how not all knowledge comes from a single source. And that piece really inspired me to learn more about the learning process. How do human beings learn? I love uh, this analogy that I thought of when reading The Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto. Hernando de Soto makes a very startling claim in that book. He asks the question, uh, who owns most of the world's capital? And you know, you're thinking about you know, Fortune 500 companies or Bill Gates or whoever, and he says that no, actually the poor own most of the world's capital. But the problem with that capital is that it doesn't have an economic life. It's, it's dead capital. And I really think that that's the situation in most classrooms around the world, uh, whether you're talking about secondary school or whether you're talking about uh, undergraduate or even graduate programs. You have rooms filled with dead intellectual capital. And most students experience formal education as an audience member. And as an audience member, you're just still quiet. And if you can pay attention, and if you can somehow incorporate someone else's understanding into yours by listening, you're in good shape. But for most of us, that really doesn't address most of our learning capacity. I've had great uh, experiences learning about economics. But a lot of them didn't take place in a classroom. They took place in long car ride discussions, um, at reading groups that we went to at cafes. And there is uh, great enthusiasm and um, a lot of dialogue. And, and sometimes when you're sitting in, in a classroom, listening to a professor talk about some theory that you haven't yet connected to, um, it's hard to be as enthusiastic about these ideas and, um, and really get them in the same way. A lot of people that come out of the classical liberal tradition, who are trying to teach ideas of liberty, they have a magnificent understanding of the complexity of the social world and the, the necessity for pr preserving that environment for choice and exchange and the freedom to explore and the freedom to make mistakes. But when they come into the classroom, many of them teach as if they're uh, Castro in charge of an island. And all of those ideas, those Hayekian ideas of, of spontaneous order get set aside. What really inspires me about teaching at UFM is that they are changing that. We're moving out of classrooms like this one and into uh, rooms where the student is at the center and where the faculty can be learning that their students are the most important resource that they have to teach. Uh, the students, like Hayek says, have knowledge that's unique to them. It's dispersed amongst all of them. So you can make that uh, intellectual capital alive by offering environments where students are choosing, where they are interacting, where they're exchanging, um, or you can put them in rooms like this where they are still silent and passive. My background is in um, Montessori education. Uh, I had a real passion for, I still have a real passion for, the ideas of Maria Montessori, who saw the classroom as, uh, in Hayekian terms, a spontaneous order, where it was the result of human action, or the students' actions, if you will, uh, but not necessarily of human design. 
I see an awful lot of what UFM is doing as an extension of some of the fundamental principles of Montessori education. Um, it's interesting. The Montessori community as a whole tends to look at the world as something that needs a central controller. Uh, I think if you talk to most Montessori teachers, their, uh, their political philosophy is very much on the left, and they see the ideas of uh, central planning as, or, or government involvement as very necessary. But that's not how they see the classroom. The goal of the teacher, according to Maria Montessori, was to become invisible. And by that she means that the student really has to discover their own capacity and their own independence as a learner. The mission of the university is to teach the principles of liberty. Um, but UFM is also embarking on this, I think, very innovative and cutting edge program uh, to make the student the center of the classroom, to awaken the student to uh, who they are as a learner and to understand their own learning process. Uh, so it just brought together two philosophies that I think uh, are hand in glove.